This episode is made possible by the good folks at Squarespace. For all of your website needs, visit squarespace.com slash you for a free trial and save 10% if you decide to go for it by using our discount code HUE at checkout. Thanks, Squarespace. Today, I get to deliver on a promise I made to someone else. He made the same promise to me, and that was to do something together. His name is Cliff Pickett. So I want to introduce you to Cliff. We met at PPE this past fall, and what struck me about Cliff is that he was so far beyond worrying about the gear. <laughs> it was really about the imagery, and he pulled out his iPhone and started showing me absolutely beautiful, beautiful images like this. story short, I did a trip up in the fall, uh, up into New England as I do every year, just my brand new full frame Sony DSLR and the iPhone. Ah, uh, uh, Sony, full frame mirrorless? Or? Full frame mirrorless. Okay. It was the A7R2 that came out. So excited about it and nothing, there's, the only thing that's better than having a brand new camera is having two brand new cameras. Oh yeah, oh yeah. So I kind of just took a trip up in the fall and I just shot with both, really. And I wasn't quite sure how I was going to approach this. By the time I got back, um, I was completely convinced. Completely convinced. I figured all the little details, all the little obstacles, and uh, I realized it, it, I had to prove to myself before I taught anybody else. It truly is a very capable camera. Yeah. And then it went beyond that. And then I realized just what the experience was like to just hop in your car. I mean, imagine that. No batteries, no memory cards, no laptops, no lenses, no lens bags, and just to experience. Overall, the bigger picture truly is, is that we don't have to wait for that time where we take our camera bag, throw it over our shoulder, and declare, I am a photographer right now, and I'm gonna photograph. I think it comes down to just being in that state all the time and just appreciating. And the right. iPhone lets you do that. I, I think that's exactly right. I find that today's cameras get in the way. Wow. That is a hunk of meat. So nice. <laughs> Hi guys. Two hands. One for this hand, one for this hand. Mrs. Maisel. Mrs. Maisel. Yeah. Oh my God. Excuse me. Is this is, is this where they did Mrs. Maisel? Yeah. Yeah, they shot um they shot a couple of scenes in here. Fantastic. Yeah. Fantastic <laughs> jackpot. I just want a camera that represents the shortest distance between my intent and my ability to execute. And I have found again and again that the iPhone lets me do that. Now, when I say iPhone, I happen to have an Apple iPhone, but I don't mean to limit it to the iPhone. It could be an Android, uh, yeah, as a, you know, Google Pixel 3 or whatever it is. It, it's fine. Way. Yeah. Doesn't mean I don't love my gear. Oh, I'm absolutely. a recovering gearaholic. But the, these smartphones are incredible, especially with computational imaging now. Think about how much technology has improved. If you were going to basically design a camera of the future, what would that look like to you? It would be sewn into my left butt cheek, I think. <laughs> I would just want to blink, right? But the shortest distance between your intuition and then a capture, that's the goal. Yeah. That, that really is a goal right there. So what is that shortest? How do you design a system that is the absolute shortest distance between those two points? That completely gets the capture picture taking process out of the way so that you can focus on what's really important. The moment, the light, the color, the gesture, the subject, all these things that really matter in the image. How do we get there? 
You know, with that being said, there are still plenty of people who would say smartphones are toys, they're not real cameras, including people uh, in whom I hold the highest regard. Of course. Well, I would say that all cameras are toys. <laughs> Fair enough. But to the people who say, ah, look, it's a super tiny sensor, and it's crap in low light, and it's really only got two focal lengths, and the bokeh is simulated, and it's just ugly, what would you say to that? We have to go to that ice cream place. This reminds me, we have to go to that ice cream place, okay? The issue to me ultimately is, what's image quality? You know, so we have a fixed focal length, we have a small sensor, we have a uh, slightly less dynamic range. All things by the way which we can fix through computational imaging. The thing that most people don't understand when they get really excited about high ISO performance is that dynamic range craters very quickly. Yeah. And that by the time you get to 12,800, which is not the sick ISO, although coming from an era of 400 where 1200 ASA was yeah. macho, they don't understand that it's half. It's yeah, half. Exactly. And so 13 stops of dynamic range suddenly becomes six by 12,800. So yeah. I keep coming back to you. You're absolutely right. It, it's less and less about those things than most people are willing to acknowledge. No, I mean, it, listen, you can argue all day long, whatever camera system that you want to use, I'll show you a better camera system. And if you have the best camera system around, wait six months. You know, there's always going to be that circle of soap there. What it really comes down to is this, you know, I, uh, I studied music for a little bit. I thought I wanted to be a musician. That, did not work out, by the way. I know a dear friend <laughs> who has the same backstory, Ted yeah, Forbes. Okay. Ted, that's for uh, you. Yeah, there's, there's surprisingly a lot of them. Um, but I, I was at Berkeley and we were, we were listening to this interview of this guy, this old jazz guitarist. And during the interview, they asked him this question, what's good music? And he just sat back and he laughed and he goes, <laughs> good music is anything just makes you want to do this. And he just starts tapping his foot, right? And if you think about it, it doesn't have to be any more complicated than that. And so when we talk about image quality, to me, that's really what's important to me is the actual quality of those image. You know, what is, does it move you? Does it make you think? Does it inspire you? This is why I've been recommending Squarespace to everyone who asks for the last four or five years, well before they began to sponsor the channel. Just like the cameras I use, including my iPhone, it gives me the shortest distance between intent and execution. I already use it for our business site. And right now, in between filming, traveling, writing, and prepping for our next workshop, I'm putting up a new website for my personal work. Of course I'm using Squarespace to do it. No futzing around, no need to engage a designer or a developer. I just sit down and bam, beautiful, simple, inexpensive, robust. There are as many reasons to build a website as there are people who want one, but especially if you're a photographer, it's a brilliant way to show your work. When I recommend Squarespace and suggest visiting them at squarespace.com slash you for a free trial, and then I tell you you can save 10% if you do decide to go for it by using our discount code HUE at checkout, it's because it's what I use too. It's that simple. You are talking about a fundamentally different notion of quality, which has to do with the substance, the content, the emotional impact of the image taken in toto. Yeah, I, th I think that we don't focus on that enough. No, no pun, pun intended. intended. Seriously, yeah, okay, okay. but absolutely true. I mean, if you think about it, the world doesn't need another well-exposed, perfectly sharp, 100 megapixel image that just bores them. We have enough pictures in the world. You look at the cover of the Museum of Modern Art retrospective on Cartier-Bresson with the forward by Peter Galassi, The Modern Century. The photograph on the cover is an iconic Cartier-Bresson image, and it isn't close to being sharp, and that doesn't matter at all. You know, I'm, I'm entirely self-taught. I, I obsessed, just like everyone else has, believe me. I've lost so many nights wondering which lens. Is there a really big difference between a 55 and an 85? Do I need that 1.8 or versus that 1.2? You know, and just yes. looking oh, up, yes. up where, yes. where, the, where the situation demands, sure. But I've lost so many nights of sleep over that. And just the experience that comes along with just not taking it 
as seriously and just playing with it. So you make a, a number of good points, but one thing that I want to go back to is all of the lenses. Again, most people don't realize that Cartier-Bresson, who is my favorite street photographer of all time, shot with a camera using one really of only two focal lengths, and he didn't swap them back and forth immediately. He would just shoot with one until he wanted to shoot with another. Yeah. 35 millimeter, 50 millimeter. And back in those days, I mean, if you ever look through the rangefinder portal, because they were two separate windows, the viewfinder and the rangefinder, it is so difficult to see. Yeah. I still have the 3A, it is so difficult to see that it's no wonder all of these guys went to zone focus anyway. So you've got some of the greatest names in the history of photography shooting with a camera of a single focal length at a medium aperture with an, it wasn't even called ISO back then, an ASA of 32. Hey, back in the day, 100 was kick ass. Yeah. And then people say, oh, they say smartphones aren't real cameras. Creative limitations. You ask anybody, anyone about this, anyone who teaches workshops, any instructors, anyone who understands the industry, they'll all tell you the same thing. Through limitation, these creative limitations gives us that room to create. Otherwise, it's like having a piano with a million keys. How are you supposed to play music on that? What a great metaphor. What a great metaphor. I find that I actually prefer shooting with primes, one prime at a time. I say to myself, okay, right now, I'm shooting with a 16 millimeter 1.4 and a crop sensor camera, 24 uh, millimeter full frame equivalent. And I am going to see the world with that frame until I decide I don't want to. And some of the best images I've ever captured have been like that. It's also a lot lighter. And the zooms are a pain in the butt. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but, and, and you do. And you actually see it in that 35 millimeter equivalent or that 24 or that 50, whatever you decide that is. Otherwise, you just stand out here with just a plethora of options. And where do you even begin, right? I mean, New York City is a perfect example for that. Everything is everywhere. It's like walking into a crowded restaurant and there's all these amazing conversations for sure, but you can't hear any of them because all you hear is everything. You need that limitation. And when you have that, the whole world opens up. Everyone shuts up and that conversation just stands there in front of you. You know, you just reminded me that I want ice cream. Let's go get some. <laughs> Let's do it. Claudie, do you need to take some, just go, 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 go. She's an Amazon. Yeah. She's an Amazon. Right? That's <laughs> Joel Myrowitz brought a, uh, a Deerdorf view camera to Central Park years ago. One of the things that he liked is that you could see everything. I want to see that on something larger than an iPhone. On the other hand, I want to see this on an iPhone too. Now think about what we have. Relatively well lit. Some contrast, right? Bright spots, dark spots, nothing too crazy. No harsh shadows. There's not a big depth of field. It doesn't matter if you shoot this at one, two, or 16. So let's talk technical for a second. How would we capture this any differently between a phone, between a medium format, between a DSLR, a full frame crop sensor? How would we capture this differently? Well, my arms would be less tired under one scenario than the next. Sure. Right? But I'd frame it the exact same way. The depth of field is the same. The resolution is going to be great. We have 12 megapixels. How long have we had professional cameras that were 12 megapixels in the industry? 12 megapixels? Yeah. My first hardcore digital DSLR was the Canon 1D, the original, yep. with 4 megapixels. <laughs> yeah. And I shot in 2002, shortly after I bought it, the first light memorial to 9-11. That yep. photograph hangs on our walls to this day. 12 megapixels is plenty. If you need more, picture, 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 right? We can right. do 60, 70, 80 megapixel. The resolution isn't the question. We have software, we have fractaling that can upsize it 500%, 1000%. That's actually not the issue. We have everything you need to shoot the camera, to shoot this image exactly how we need to with the phone. You know, the question all the time, do you shoot RAW, do you shoot JPEG? So the answer is neither. <laughs> the JPEG format's 25 years old, right? It's 27, 28 years old now. It's archaic. This new system, the HEIC, is half the size of a JPEG, 
right? The new iPhones are doing something like five to six trillion operations a second. It's a 10-bit file. It can handle up to 16 bits like a TIFF. Just take a single picture, just that, like that. That's exactly what I would do. I wouldn't think about it anymore. Yep. That, that's it. If I wanted to, sure. Okay, how can I increase the resolution? Well, I can put it in portrait mode. I can turn it vertically, and now I can stitch multiple pictures. And I can, I can stitch that in post without a problem. Pounder mode, you have a, a few different issues with that. One, you're gonna have some ghosting, you're gonna have some people that are moving. Two, if it starts getting lower, lower light, the panel mode is giving you a single image, which means that it increases the shutter speed, which means it increases the ISO. What you're much better off doing is shooting individual images and stitching later. Okay, now we have, I'm gonna put in a live photo. That opens up a few different opportunities. We can go in here, we can look at our photos. And with the live photo, we have movement in the frame, which just gives you a little bit different of a way of looking at it. But if we flick up, now we can create a long exposure. If we needed to remove people from a scene, it gives us an instant long exposure that's right there. You can post it to Instagram, you can post it to Facebook, post it wherever you want. It's right there, right? And that's important, I think. You didn't need a laptop. You, you didn't, didn't need, need a, a computer. You didn't need anything. And more than that, if we're talking about a tool that's, let's face it, we're creatives. We're creating, right? That feedback loop is critical. If you remember in the film days. They always used to have Polaroid backs. The professionals used that. They needed it. They didn't sit there and say, oh, I'm awesome. I'm nailing exposure every time. Yeah. I don't know of a photographer, no matter how professional, who gets the exposure right every time. They don't. And even then they have an estimate, right? So then we get our DSLRs. We can take a picture, we chimp. We can look at the back of it, take a picture, look at the back of it. Now with the mirrorless, we can look at it in real time. But now we're Fantastic. at a point where we can actually go into our photos. This is the next generation, is that we can put in a live preview. Let's say we want to see what this looks like in black and white. Before we even take the picture, we can visualize what this is going to look like in a high contrast black and, and white. And in fact, I love to set my viewfinder on my real cameras to black and white because it's a great aid for composition. Yes. If the color isn't the purpose of the photograph, I say get rid of it as you're visualizing and framing up. Yeah, if it doesn't add to it, it takes it away from it. Yep. Right? So having a system like this, you can take that image, you can get a live preview of it, you can snap right there, and then the best part is you can edit it right on the fly. Did I actually get that shot? Right. Right, you can actually edit it. And this say, is yeah, where you can do I over did. in the moment. You can bring it in the way I set it up. I use Lightroom, by the way. It's set up to auto add every image I take. No matter what camera system I'm using, no matter what app I'm using, I can go in here and it's going to start adding. These are just some images I brought up before. Gotcha. It's just going to start adding to the very top all the images I just took. Then I can go in here and I can start editing right away to see, all right, what do I want to do with it? Do I like that scene? Great. But maybe, you know what, it's a little bit askew. I can go in here to geometry. Oh, yeah. Turn on auto. This now is I'm fantastic. Maybe increase the shadows a little bit, increase the whites a little bit, increase uh, the vibrancy. And with this, probably a little bit of dehaze. It's just gonna bring out a lot of that texture. It's very subtle, but now you go from an image that like, yeah, I, I wonder what that will look like too. You can actually realize the potential of the image while you're here. If I don't like it, I can go back in and take another photo. I'm not gonna realize that later on in a week or two when I'm at my laptop in my basement. So. You know what this is making me think about? Ice cream. ice cream. Yeah. You are especially adept at the use of apps to broaden the performance of the iPhone. So can you take us through some of those, Cliff? So basically these apps, um, I approach people on two different levels. One is using it as a camera, as a creative, you know, image capture tool. But then there's also the, the other way about it is the apps that you can use just as a photography perspective. Figuring out where the sun's going to be, what's the weather pattern going to be like remote triggering, um, scouting, a lot of different ways to scout with maps, for instance. Uh, Geotagging yep. is another great feature. I cannot believe it's in 2019, we still have cameras that don't have GPS. Not only do you have GPS built into all the cameras, for any picture that we take, for instance, 
<laughs> we can take these pictures. It's always gonna show us, depending on what image that we're looking at, it's gonna show us exactly where, where we took these pictures. I mean, that's really helpful for a lot of levels. But what we can do with some of these other apps is basically go in and for geotags, for instance, it'll keep a digital breadcrumb trail of where you are and you can just marry that up later in other software and it keeps, it'll basically tell you exactly where you took these pictures. What a great way to track the murals and wall art that we see in Manhattan. So many of these different things that we can use. And so I do a whole lecture just on basically how we can use this as the single most important tool for a photographer, regardless of whether or not you're actually using it as a camera or not. It's incredibly, it is the most important tool if you know how to use it properly. But using it as a camera, so we talked about it before, some of those creative limitations, but what we didn't really talk about is all these other possibilities that come up when we have these supercomputers married to these, you know, these camera systems. And so this computational photography, that's typically what they call it now, it opens up a lot more opportunities. Of course. We talk about like creativity, for instance, and depth of field is one of them. And we don't have a shallow depth of field because we're shooting with a small sensor and a fixed wide angle. Well, ah, yeah. right, it's interesting because we're finding ways to get around the physics of this is really what it's coming down to. So sure, the creative limitation is we get everything in focus. And sometimes that's a good thing, especially if you're shooting landscapes. If you're shooting portraits, for instance, it can be very different. You want a shallow depth of field. But a lot of these newer systems, the way they get around it, for instance, is where we have two cameras. So we take, a, we take advantage of that parallax that can be created, and we create a live depth map in real time, and then we can adjust that after the fact, right? So if we do one for you, since I have you in this beautiful light right now. <laughs> yes, of course. We might as well take advantage of that. There's just no way it's gonna look, I'm gonna look as good as when Claudia takes it. <laughs> There we go. Oh, there's our portrait right there. So now we go into this. And sure, we have everything in focus and that's how iPhone, that's how all cell phone cameras used to look. And that's how we can tell right away as a photographer, was that taken on a phone or not. But now we do have the option of going in here and just creating a much shallower depth of field, which gives us a lot of really creative potential if you think about it. Now we can get everything in focus and decide later where do we want that focus to be? We don't have to worry about whether that eye is going to be in focus or not. We don't want to adjust it that way, but it will give us a depth map that we can adjust. Now, if we bring this into apps like Lightroom, for instance, we can actually make adjustments based upon the depth map in real time. Interesting. I use very, focus very interesting. for that. I, I think that's a little more flexible than the camera app that comes with the iPhone. But now the Lightroom app, and this is, you don't have to be an Adobe subscriber to even use our camera system. Yay. There's actually really important features. So one that we can shoot, if I go to our, um, our professional mode, for instance, we have the option to shoot in RAW, right? And this is one of the limitations that used to be actually, you know, a legitimate complaint was we were shooting in JPEGs. Well, we spoke about these HEICs very briefly, right. but basically it's a wrapper that will cut all of your, your file size in half and also give you a much higher bit depth. So much better, you won't worry about banding. There's a lot of different- Well, what features. kind of bit depth are we talking about? 10 bit, 12 bit, 14, 16? It, it has the capability of going up to 16 bits. Really? Yeah, so basically- That's like, Cassie H6D territory. Yes, yes. Right now we're capturing 10 bits, okay. which is better than the 8 bit that we're capturing on the JPEGs now. Yeah. Plus, it's wrapping in um, multiple images, so we can do depth capture with multiple lenses. It's wrapping in live photos, so we'll encode video, audio. All this is get wrapped up in a container. So now, we can, when we talk about computational photography, we can take advantage of multiple lenses, burst images, smart HDR, all of these features combined. It gives us a lot of, a lot of more crea you know, creative potential. You know, you just spouted more technical terms in a shorter period of time than I have ever done. So stop hocking me. <laughs> okay. But the whole point of it is there is so much technology going on behind the scenes. Right. And the only thing that we have to do is press this button. That's it, really. I mean, if you talk about, we could even go on and on about what smart HDR is now. But essentially on these new cameras, it's taking the pictures before you even take the pictures. I want to make a point. It was Steve Jobs who famously said, doing simple is hard and yet here we are in 2019 say what you will that apple is not the apple that it was there's good and bad in that but in this regard this technology is absolutely faithful to that principle laid down by steve jobs
Oh, this is the place you're talking this about. This is the place okay. we're talking about. Peanut butter cup. Pistachio pesto. I'm Hugh Brownstone with Cliff Pickett. See you next time. This episode was brought to you by Squarespace. For all your website needs, visit squarespace.com slash Hugh and save 10% when you purchase by using the discount code Hugh at checkout. Thanks again, Squarespace, for supporting our work and for giving us the platform we use to do our work.